I met Caroline in 1997 when we were part of a cooperative called the Wanish Gallery which was a cooperative of about 12 of us artists, makers and ran very nicely for three years and then it petered out but Caroline and I were quite keen on the idea of carrying on the gallery so we took it over and we ran that then for another three years. That was our first taste of it. Around about the time we started the gallery, because I started uh, the Wanish Gallery, I had my life drawings there. I didn't have sculptures. And then I'd always wanted to sculpt, so I did sculpture at Adult Education in Guildford with Carol Orwin, the tutor. And that was brilliant, really, and I just uh, loved it and started sculpting figures, mainly, and casting them as well, inspired by the human figure, mainly. And then I did my dog for one Christmas show, my old dog, and it just sold and sold and sold. And from then on, really, the dogs have rather taken over. I still cast the small pieces myself, but I, I use a caster for anything big. Bronze resin, you have real bronze powder, and you mix that with liquid resin to quite a creamy, thick consistency. Layer that into the rubber mold and then you back that up with either fiberglass or a solid fill, depending on the piece. And when you wire wool it, you're taking away all that plastic on the surface and you get a bright bronze and it will patinate. It's interesting working as a partnership. Caroline and I have been working a very long time together. Next year will be 20 years of Lingwood Samuel. And we, we really do work very well, actually. It's, uh, she's incredibly creative, artistic, uh, a real creator, and has a, a vision, a very clear vision. I know the work I like from other people, and I can spot talent, but the vision she's got for the interior of the gallery and the hanging is very precise. I quite enjoy the admin and finding the artists and contacting the artists and dealing with them and she's not mad on uh, paperwork and um, phoning artists or you know that sort of thing I tend to do more than her which is fine the dynamic works amazingly well when I left university I went on to open a wedding dress shop making the dresses and embroidering them because at Goldsmiths, my degree was in fine art textiles. And when I left to make a living, I knew that I could do that, making dresses, etc., where people would pay the money for the embroidery. But very soon, I realised I wanted to go back to the fine art side of it, which was my real love. And I started doing that, and we moved out to Chamois Green, and I started my first sort of small studio from home there. A few years later, I joined a cooperative where I met Margaret Samuel. We were both working artists with young children, so the cooperative seemed like a very good idea. That became the Wanish Gallery, and we were there for six years, inviting other artists to exhibit with us. The landlord decided to sell up, and we spent probably ten years looking for premises. During that 10 years, we put on large exhibitions in private houses. So we would have 20 to 30 artists, and we would have a big a sculpture trail in the grounds. And this is when we first had Richard's work. And then, coming up for five years ago, we, we found this property. The building is a grade two listed building, which again, is something which we were very passionate about having a, a very special space and we wanted to make the space almost home-like then it's not a traditional white walled space we hope that when people walk in they don't feel put off that it's too sterile it's trying to help them to understand how a painting or a piece of sculpture 
or a ceramic could actually work in their own home and and that is that's very a very strong part of what we do here in the gallery margaret and i although we both curate the exhibitions in finding the different artists we do have different skill sets um i definitely am the one that does most of the hanging of the exhibition but always with margaret's help margaret's skills she's very much the one that deals with the computer and the websites and following up emails payments etc so she tends to be more hands-on on that side but everything we do together more or less with both of us having our own little niches most of the artists that we have here at the gallery we have either seen at different exhibitions or shows etc and we know the type of work that we feel will fit, but we will both pick up cards, talk to the artist if they're there, and then come back and discuss who we would like to show. Each exhibition we try to theme it so that we, we want the work to flow. My work has evolved over the years, but when I turned back to more the fine art side, I still had a, a strong textile base in my work. I still have some textile work as I would call myself both a painter and a mixed media sculptor and so sometimes textiles comes into that but it is beginning to fade out although I do use textile techniques but not necessarily with fabric or thread I might be using silver or wire. When we ask artists to exhibit with us especially say with the the painters we will normally ask them for six to eight pieces depending on size we have a strong vision which is reflects our taste and so we do look further afield we have local people and if we feel that um local people's work fits in then that's great but it's very hard just to keep just local mm. art. people will either deliver or they will post it career it generally as as I am both an artist and a, a gallery owner, I think I have a good understanding of how it is to stand in the artist's shoes. I think a lot of pure gallerists wouldn't because they're trying to sell work, but um, they don't see it from an artist's point of view. So I know they have expectations and I don't want to let them down. And I have to say there are times when work comes in and I think, wow, this is amazing, this will walk out the door, and it doesn't. And then other times work will come in and I'm thinking, mm, I'm not sure how will that go with our clientele, and it just all goes. So although we obviously have an idea of what will and won't, sometimes one is surprised. We are in very difficult times at the moment, we have been for the last few years. People are reticent, but we have a very good, loyal following who always support us. I don't think we sell just to uh, regular clients. I suppose what I would say is that we have a good body of regular clients and a mailing list, mm -hmm. but we always have new people coming in every exhibition, and which, which is why we try to always have new work, because by having new work, it keeps things fresh. We're not like a shop that always has the same staff. Somebody who may not have known we were here, something in the window, they may have walked past a number of times, but nothing's caught their eye, and then you have a piece that does, and that will bring them in and then they will come back. When we invite an artist to exhibit with us we have looked at their prices beforehand so that we have an idea because being a small provincial gallery as such we have an idea of a threshold of a price that we can potentially have work at but the prices are set by the artist. They know what our commission is and it is extremely difficult because it's how does one price one's work? Is it on hourly rate? Is it what you think it should be? It's a minefield. So it has to be something that the artist at the end of the day has to be happy. So if they come to us and, and you know, they're not sure how much to sell their work for, we will advise whether we think that we can sell the work for that. But I would never tell them how much it should be because I don't know what goes into it. 
So what is something worth? It's, is it worth what somebody will pay for it? But if you are spending a long, long time making it and you can't sell it for that, you're not going to be able to make a living from it. So why are you doing it? Sometimes one has to make work which is slightly more commercial, but still have work which is following your heart and what you really want to do, but at least have some other work which perhaps you can make your living from, but enables you to do the other work, and the other work might then take off and you will be able to make it pay. But as both Margaret and I are working on we do understand that. That's all we can do is, uh, is advise, really. The emailing list is several hundred now, and so I email them. That'll be going out this week. Several hundred followers on Facebook and Instagram. So I'll do it on Facebook, I'll do it on Instagram, I'll do the mailing list. And that is it, certainly for this exhibition. For the Christmas exhibition, we'll send out a card as well and put that in various different places. On our website, there are examples and I will post on Instagram regularly so you can access that from the website and there will be examples of people work but there's not an online catalogue as such. There's a list of the featured artists. I don't list every single person, I mean I'm not on it, Caroline's not on it because we're always there but the new artists are on it and if we've got new work from somebody who's come before they'll be on it. So say somebody's exhibited with us twice before I'd put, and they're coming specifically for this exhibition, they'll go on it again. What we don't have is a selling page, but we have sold quite a number of pieces via social media and via the website. A surprising amount happens on Instagram without seeing physically the piece. I will send them more photographs and I have sold a big picture to uh, New York. They'd not seen it and the shipping was obviously very expensive. The customs forms and everything is quite expensive when it gets over 300. That all gets more complicated. I saw Rich's work on a street market in Godalming a number of years ago. He was making lovely jugs uh, with insects and butterflies and bees on. And I said, to Car I bought one and showed it to Caroline and said, look, I think these are nice. How about it? And she said, yeah, that's fabulous. So he came and he exhibited at an exhibition we had at her house. It was a good few years ago now. And of course he's gone on from there to much different work. And we've seen his more recent work and thought, yes, that would be fabulous for us again. I was just blown away by how the work had grown and evolved and how the feeling of almost the delftware and the tiles was also a part of these more, far more sculptural pieces as well. And both Mark and I just felt it would sit really well in the gallery, which is why we then approached him again. It's funny because I often try to think about where it all started really and it's a difficult one because you pursue a particular path in your career and you end up in a place that you could never have imagined being and you don't ever consider how you got there or where it started and I think probably a lot of the early influences I had really shaped my interest. I used to go to a sugar craft class with my mum when I was a kid. My dad was away in the military a lot so my mum was sort of my primary carer really and I used to just get taken along wherever she went in a good way because she was always doing interesting things. She was very into the outside world and we did a lot of walking and she was interested in crafts and making things. I mean she came from a reasonably poor background in North Wales and they knitted their own clothes. They had no electricity, no running water. So she's always had a, my mum's always had a make do and mend side to her really. 
And I think that that's sort of passed on to me. Making has always been important. And actually, when I look at my dad's family, his granddad was a, a carpenter. I think, you know, there are makers in the family. I think it just somehow feels right. But I think Sugarcraft is probably the closest to clay that I came to from a very early age and didn't then pick up clay until I was at college really I mean I was always interested in art and making as but clay became more cemented in me I guess um, when I got to college because I had a very inspirational teacher who was a production potter and I just remember watching him throw and just thinking my god I want to be able to do that you know it, there was nothing profound it was just wow the same reaction anybody has to any maker making something well with a skill any skill whatever it is part of me thought it might impress the girls if I could do it which is another thing that adolescent teenagers tend to think about and I just started playing with clay I was on a general b-tech at college general art and design and my projects slowly began to be turned towards clay whatever it was clay was the outcome and then I sort of decided to to go to Farnham to to study ceramics and that's where it, it really became a firm part of of me of my life really of, you know as a, as a material it just sort of offered me everything at Farnham I initially went to do an, a BA and I actually stayed on to do my MA my dad was always about education I was one of the first in in his family to go to university a 3d design course but it was about creating a way of thinking understand other people and and work with other people and and live with other people and i think it, it was invaluable for that i mean certainly the ma whether it was the right time i think had i had time out hindsight's a wonderful thing if i was looking to go back now having worked within a commercial sphere with ceramics for a few years now I would possibly get more or make more of it certainly but it doesn't mean to say it wasn't a, a really useful time because I think unlike the BA I was looking towards my career more so I was thinking more about how what I was going to do once I finished and there was more support in some ways to urge you to have a more holistic approach to your practice making sure that your practice was not only a skill-based process-based thing but it was also a conceptually sustaining thing so something that you would could potentially find interest in for the rest of your life as opposed to something that was very directed towards a specific project and I think I found I certainly found things that sustained me for at least the first three or four years outside of, of that environment The work became more personal as my toolbox of skills became more proficient. I was probably making tiles for eight years, maybe ten years before this work started, which was much more personal. And you get to the stage where you're so used to working in the material, you want it to become a language. You, you want it to use the material as a tool to express your own ideas. And I think I never really understood that concept when I was in in the university environment they were always one thing or the other and I was actually just making domestic wear and I was really I, I loved wood firing and I still love wood firing I don't get much opportunity to do it but I think there wasn't a merging of those two areas they were always very separate things so my sketchbook work and my thinking was always outside of my making in many respects but then my making was always process driven at the time so actually that was enough my ideas revolved around process if that makes sense but it's only as you, you start to work with clay longer term I felt this desire to start exploring the material qualities of the clay and and just getting on in life thinking about having children and, and my dad became ill and ideas and priorities change you start to think about your place in the world and who you are and it was really when when my dad passed away that this work really took hold I guess because I started to really think about myself and my wife had just had my daughter my dad passed away and I knew a bit about his background and I guess I just started to I was more aware about my place in the world and what I wanted for my daughter and actually I had a, I think as you do when you become a parent yourself you have a newfound respect for your own parents because you don't necessarily consider them people and I think, you know, I had this overwhelming respect for what my dad had achieved, considering the sort of background he came from. And so, yeah, that sort of really started this whole journey. I was doing a lot of reading around the empire, around migration. The latest work, which is Blue and White, that all stemmed from working actually on a fireplace up at the Watts Gallery in Compton in Surrey. And I've, I got given these tiles to recreate and it was a fireplace that's actually in the studio, in the making studio there. 
and they said, oh, you know, can you recreate these? The builders have damaged and taken them out, which is inevitable because tiles always get broken. They're early, early Dutch tiles. And it was only when I started researching the designs that actually there were tiles that were English that I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint these designs. Some of them were Southwark, you know, London blue and white. And I just like the idea that something sort of so synonymous with one place, um, i.e. the Dutch, but it you know, was obviously the Chinese, the Japanese, everybody was using this colour co combination before that, but something that immediately spoke of a particular place and the connotations of that in terms of the Dutch trading companies. It just somehow felt like it was, it summed up stylistically the sort of experiences I've been having my whole life, but not really kind of necessarily acknowledged because there was always this immediate assumption that I was of somewhere else or not of this place. And it would usually be the sort of fairly mundane, oh, so where are you from? Which is a very, it's a very direct question to ask someone that you may not know that well. And you'd never consider asking it in to anybody other than someone that looks different to you. Essentially, that was all summed up in this one thing that stylistically looked of a place, but actually had so many different homes from all over the world. It was a style that had been copied throughout the world for centuries. When I took Froil on, my intention really was to use it as a conduit to allow me to make my own work. I was intending to use that to subsidise it and allow me to have the equipment to produce my own work, which to, a, to an extent it does. But what I hadn't expected was that it would require a massive input in terms of energy and time. And it would become the sort of main focus of what I do to a, to a degree. It would provide me a livelihood, but equally it would provide me an opportunity to learn an awful lot about the material. I'm going to diversify the business to, to an extent to incorporate some, some educational activities, which will hopefully allow me to step out of some of the production and leave me a bit more time for my own work, as well as a sort of a lasting legacy, I think, because I think really education is sort of where it's at. Unless you're passing on any knowledge that you've gained over the years, it becomes useless, really. I think getting involved with a diverse range of activities offers something back as well. Getting out and meeting people when teaching them, you learn. And, it, it, you know, it's a bit of a cliche to say you always learn more than you ever teach. But actually, I think it's true. You do. You just meet people from different backgrounds. You, I think particularly for makers, where it is a fairly isolated, fairly sort of introverted thing making your own work because it has to be actually getting out and meeting people is important, how, however you do that. In terms of selling work, I do that in a number of ways. Up until recently, this year, just because it's been very busy, I would do two or three shows a year. That would include something like Hatfield. I used to do Art in Action, which was a wonderful event. I also do, uh, have done previously uh, Ceramic Art London. But I don't do masses of shows purely because it requires a massive amount of work to collect enough stock up to sustain two or three days selling. Actually, it tends to work far better to supply galleries who require 15, 20 pieces at a time and then you top them up. And they take a commission, but it's well earned. And actually, when I've actually looked at the figures and look at how much it's cost me to do the shows and how much I've sold and how much I've made, you know, obviously deducting my time, it's actually fairly comparable. They're equally as profitable. Generally, you don't sell so much as quickly because they've got less customers coming in on a daily basis. I mean, a show like Ceramic Art London, I would imagine, would have a couple of thousand visitors a day, if not more, and a gallery would rarely have close to that. But it goes out and you get a check at the end of the month and it, it trickles back in. So it's it requires an investment of your own in stock, in the cost of making that stock. But once it's out there, it generally gets sold at some point. The only difficulty is you've got to be very strict about keeping track of stock. It's all too easy to have stock sat in a gallery for long periods of time and then it becomes almost past your own thinking. So you need to ask for it back to give you the opportunity to sell it elsewhere before it's too, too far behind your, your current ideas. But that's the only thing. I'd say that's the only negative thing. Whereas obviously if you're making and selling it yourself, you have sort of better control over what you've got. But I just keep stock sheets and as things come in, as payments come in, I tick them off the stock sheet and then I know what I've got where unless you're invoicing people regularly trying to keep tra track of money and who owes you what and things like that, you never consider it. It's important to leave the decision of who's exhibiting to them. And, and, and that comes back to trusting the people who are putting together the shows, because actually, so long as you know that they're going to do a, a good job, you sort of feel happy to trust that they, they will. The gallery that has been most successful for me is the Stratford Gallery. They tend to hold work all the time. Howard and Emma there are 
wonderful. They're ceramics enthusiasts. And ultimately, you just need to find the galleries who are passionate about your work because I'll, that will it, it is what sells it. And having people that are passionate about ceramics is the next best thing to standing there yourself and extolling the virtues of what you've made. Bills and Rye have always been very good. They're generally of independence where the people running them are passionate. And I think in Godalming, that's the same situation. They're just um, passionate people. They're passionate. They're makers. They make. So they, they get it. They would, in my mind, make the most effective salespeople for, for anything that, that I make, really. I've known Margaret and Caroline for a long time, so in a sense our working relationship goes way back. When I was artist in residence at Cranley Art Centre over 15 years ago, I used to make work and they would hold pop-up exhibitions in a house on the outskirts of Cranley and they would sell work from the site there during the artist, Surrey Artist Open Studio generally and at one point they are, invited me to be part of that and I sent work and sold some pieces there. We've sort of all gone in our own directions and at that point they didn't have the gallery. I've been all over the place, generally had my head buried in tiles and they took on the gallery which funnily enough was in the tile market in Godalming, uh, what was the tile market in Godalming that we used to supply tiles to um, and then they asked me whether I'd be interested in exhibiting and of course they've got a proven track record and they're very well established makers in their own right so I think it's got to be a great environment to be in and certainly a lot of the social media stuff I've seen looks really great. I think the work they've got is of a high calibre and I feel fortunate to have privileged to have been asked really to be part of, of their of their space. When it comes to price it's always very difficult I think pricing work because there's a number of considerations one of which is obviously the amount of labour that goes into it but then there's always that ambiguous element which comes down to the stage you're at in your career where the work is where you feel you're at where you feel you can price the work and sustain that price. With the tiles I tend to find it's a very straightforward process but when it comes to the pots it's far more difficult because it is so subjective. You're sort of ultimately pricing it at a point where you feel somebody else will accept that that's a realistic price also. It's very easy to undersell yourself. It's very easy to set too high a price. I mean, it's, I think it's just one of those things that comes down to experience and learning coupled with how long it takes you to make it and the kind of nuts and bolts of the pricing, your actual costs, you know, the firing costs, the cost certainly in this, the cost of the decals, the cost of the glaze, the cost of the material, the cost of my time. Potters tend to, to undervalue their labour. I only know that certainly now my time is valuable because I don't have much of it, so I have to price it realistically because otherwise I can't really justify making it. My time is definitely my limiting factor. I've got to the stage now where I've got so many different things coming up three months out for the throwdown filming, and that's a quarter of my year taken up in, in one activity. Organising the Art in Clay event, that sort of squeezes around everything else in late evenings. Work, you know, this work tends to be 8.30 onwards, weekdays mostly. As well as being a distraction to business, the throwdown has been, I think, useful in many ways. I'd be naive to think that it hasn't raised my profile um, in the ceramics world because I think it's been a show that's been very useful to the ceramics scene, really. You know, I think it's it's encouraged people to get back into to clay if they've not worked with clay for a while. It's encouraged new people to the discipline. And I think it's put ceramics into the front rooms of four million people on a weekly basis, which has to be beneficial. I think certainly my role on the show, I remained under the radar enough that it's raised my profile with people who knew about it. But I'm not walking down the street or going to Tesco's and people are asking for photographs, which is great because I do not court that kind of element. It's certainly not something I expected to be involved with as a you know when I got involved with ceramics it's not something that was even on 
my radar. And that said, it's been a, it's been a really interesting learning experience. You know, learning about that kind of world and being immersed in it for a long period of time has been interesting. I've met people from you know all sorts of different industries that I probably never would have encountered otherwise. And yeah, I'm sure I've sold pots because of it. And certainly when it's showing on the TV, you know, there's more social media going around and I'm sure that's been beneficial. All of that said, it's very stressful. It's great fun. I mean, really great fun being part of a team of people that are all incredibly good at what they do. I mean, I think that's something that I'd sort of not necessarily been part of, you know, I mean, everybody's a freelancer and they're all only there because they, they're very good at what they do. And so being part of a team of people like that is, has been really, really great. Watching the contestants as part of the throwdown is has been mind blowing because actually realising what is possible. I mean, we push every element of the process. And I mean, over the last 13, 14 years with the tiles, you know, we've had tight deadlines and we've pushed push clay to its limits push process to its limits so I'm kind of well used to doing that but it's my own work and actually sort of pushing what are essentially kind of amateur makers to their limits to the limits of the process to limits of the material has been mind-blowing you know I mean just seeing what's possible it just makes you feel like anything is possible because I think we all very easily sort of set barriers up or we get fed these rules that you can do this you can't do that you do this like this you do this like that you know but actually to sort of see people just find their way and, and make things that you would never imagine making and you know in time scales you would never give yourself in very in a very sort of strange environment very pressured environment it's mind-blowing to watch it's been very really interesting you know and obviously the lovely thing about being part of the show and not watching the end result is you feel you're watching it in real time so you're watching these people develop week to week and gain confidence and yeah it's it's inspiring you know it's really inspiring watching the potters and what they achieve it's just it's amazing and I'm just there to try and make sure that things don't blow up but obviously I only ever work with what they give me so you know it's not like I'm in any way shaping the result you know that's that's down to sort of how they make what how they approach the challenges or not I throw the basic forms a lot of the forms and the rim details and things are based around chimney pots so I was looking at a lot of old traditional chimney pot manufacturers things like that and again that's to sort of cement it in British industry I guess and then I leave them to harden off for maybe a day, a couple of days, depending on how warm the environment is. And then I emboss them using wooden tools of varying sizes, which relate to finished sizes. I then either do watercolours, or more recently I've been drawing digitally straight into an iPad. So I do all of the drawings, and then I use a company in Stoke-on-Trent that produce digital transfers uh, to order. They're then cut up placed in water they're all water float transfers floated off and then applied to a fully glazed pot it was ceramic art london was the first time i made this work for 2016 and i was literally outside ceramic art london and i'd made all this work i'd interviewed my mum and dad and i was waiting in the lay-by he was in the van waiting to help me unload and, and everything else on the setup day and i got a call from my mum and she just found my dad dead so I set up the show. The whole show was just a blur, but it was one of those things where actually it was probably a good bubble to be in. It was heart-wrenching because I was talking about my family and my dad and the history of the pieces for the whole weekend and people were just wanting to engage with that and I'd made this book with pictures of me and my mum and my dad and really it was just tough, you know. But in hindsight, it was really positive because actually you don't get that opportunity to discuss things like that in such a positive way. And actually everybody that comes to a show like that is really open to what you're doing and they want to learn about you and you. This jug is it's a fairly early piece. So a lot of this is starting to think about some of the themes that I was looking to explore. For example, it's got HMS Victory here, which is one of the images which is almost the most incongruous really on here because everything else tends to relate either directly to the Empire or Britain or uh, Guyana where my uh, dad was from or Wales where my mum was from but HMS Victory was something that I visited. My dad was stationed at HMS Dryad so I was brought up in Emsworth and I used to go to the historic dockyards all the time. Victory was a ship that I visited on a number of occasions and it was only through reading a, a book by David Olsoga 
uh, recently that I realised that a fifth of the crew on HMS Victory were from the colonies. And it was just one of those things that had been missed from my experience of the ship and something that I thought would have been fairly relatable as a young person. All of these are verses from the James Thompson poem, Rule Britannia. That, that's all on there because I was just, I was in the studio actually listening to Radio 4 and they were talking about the Women's Institute and they were saying that uh, Jerusalem wasn't really a fitting anthem for the Women's Institute anymore. And they were talking about potentially other, other songs that could be used and uh, Rule Britannia was one of them. And I thought actually, you know, because my dad was in the Royal Marines, he was, but he was a Royal Marines bandsman, so he was uh, a musician. I used to go to all of his functions and engagements as a kid and I would hear him play things like Rule Britannia. In fact, I've got a record in my collection which is him in Canada playing Rule Britannia bizarrely. This is the Demerara River, which is really why Guyana in South America was so important to the empire. Guyana is on the Caribbean Sea, but it's landlocked because it's part of South America. But the Demerara River extends about 70 miles inland and it's a, a deep water channel, deep enough to take ships in. So it was the one place that they had the protection of the estuary and they could essentially drop off uh, slaves and pick up sugar from the very fertile growing grounds which were on the, on the banks of the river. So it was fought for between the Dutch and the English an awful lot and changed hands regularly. But it was at the time the finest sugar in, in, in the world really, Demerara sugar, and it became one of the biggest uh, trading ports because of it in mm. the Caribbean. We've got the Welsh dragon. And that's because it's sort of a f familiar emblem to me, really. And it, my mum is Welsh and it's just a symbol that I used to see an awful lot because there's a sort of a patriotism that Welsh people have that is unlike anybody else in any other sort of regional part of, uh, of the UK. So it had to be on there and it acknowledges my mum's history. But she went into the army as well. So we've got the Women's Royal Army Corps emblem here. And further down, we've got the... Uh, Royal Marines uh, emblem here and that again you know that's to sort of signify my parents working career really my mum was in the army stationed in Germany my dad was uh, in the Royal Marines band for nearly 30 years my granddad great granddad was a, a prospector out in South America they call them pork knockers and he would lead expeditions into the Guyanese interior to look for gold and diamonds and I mean it's all a fairly clouded history. We don't know exactly what was happening and what did and what didn't. And it seems to be the, the case that he said this, she said that. But the, the, the end result is that a diamond was found and the, the two American chaps who were sort of part of this expedition, who I presume were funding, funding it, um, actually split the proceeds quite generously with my great granddad. And so he was able to buy a bakery and a shop and some property in Guyana. And then as independence came round, Guyana fell to bits politically, really. Um, There's a lot of corruption in the government. And when, when it was sort of finally given independence, literally a lot of the assets, as it were, were taken out of the country um, and it was left with nothing. In the lead up, there was a lot of violence on the streets. And my granddad made the decision to move over here because it was the early 50s. So there was still a sort of tail end of that call for a labour force to kind of help support Britain's economy really after the after the Second World War. He came over and worked on the buses and he sent for the children gradually. So my dad, being the eldest son, he and his brother came first when he was 10. And then within a couple of years, my granddad passed away from cancer and my dad was then sort of head of the household. So at 15, he joined the military to fund the household. And I think being a black 15 year old in the military in the what late 60s early 70s was probably quite a tough place to be
recognize that. Very famous book, which I now think of at the moment. That's a nice thing. Yeah, yeah that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's the Northern Lights. Yeah, yeah. 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 Northern Lights. Yeah. 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 Y